My enemies surround me, the strong bulls of Bashan. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media, where we address the problems of a modern world. Today's topic, the demonic crucifixion celebration. Now, this is how you study your Bible. Topics covered, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Bulls of Bashan and the land of the Rephaim, the serpent seed. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most importantly, enjoy the show. The greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. So Psalms 22, verse 6. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of all the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying he trusted in the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So that was an utterance. Um, I bet you didn't know King David was a prophet. And King David in the Psalms was in the spirit, and he saw his prodigy, his descendant, the Messiah, he could see, it was almost as if he was seeing through the Messiah's eyes, experiencing what the Messiah was exper experiencing on the cross. And so these utterances come back, and Messiah, he actually quotes it. So a lot of people don't think of King David as a prophet, but yeah, he was a prophet too. His prophecies come out in the Psalms because he was a musician. All you mu musicians out there, um, maybe you can relate to it. But he was in the spirit and he could see the suffering of Hamashiach, colloquially, colloquially called Jesus the Christ. And through those eyes, he could see Matthew 27, verse 39. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking him with the scribes and the elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. We will believe in him. So miracles do not convert people. You follow? Miracles are attention getters. Though they saw a miracle, they would they would never have been believers anyway. It would have just been like a, with them either a fear factor, um, or hey, let me get jump on this guy's bandwagon so I can become powerful. You know, ride his coattails and become powerful along with them. But it wasn't about repentance and conversion. And so we, we get into this, uh, you know, the, the utterance of David seeing through the eyes of Messiah the, the torment, the torture. And he uttered these words, and Messiah on the cross re utters them. In Matthew 27, verse 43, he, he trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So there he is. He's re-uttering re-uttering, re, re reiterating, if you will, the words of King David. And this is all coming back. So we read in Psalm 22, verse 12. Now this gets interesting. Here's where we get to the spiritual aspect of it. This arbitrary statement about bulls of Bashan. What, what about these bulls of Bashan? Or Bashan, let's say Bashan. 
Many bulls have compassed me about. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round about. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. This, my friends, is crucifixion language. King David is feeling the pain. And he, he, when he came out of it, he must have been horrified. Their bulls of Bashan, they compass me about. Strong bulls of Bashan. Why that imagery? Why that? He's, he's, his bones are out of joint. I mean, he's hanging on that cross, and literally his bones come out of sockets. His knees come out of sockets. His shoulder comes out of the socket. He's a mess. He's in intense agony. But yet there are these bulls that have encompassed him about. Strong bulls of Bashan. What could that be a reference to? Most people, when they, when they read that crucifixion scene, they, they read it at face value. I mean, well, this is what it says, this is what happened, blah, blah, blah. Well, well, what's the imagery? It's telling you something. What is it telling you? Why a reference to bulls of Bashan? What is important about bulls and what is important about Bashan, right? Well, let's dig in, because it gets weird. And you ha those who worship must worship in spirit, bulls of Bashan, because the spirit is the key to understanding the scriptures, not the face of it. It's what is beneath it. Most of what you see in the ocean is under the ocean, not on the face of the ocean. So what could these bulls represent? There's a lot going on here. Let's dig in. So in Psalm 68, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, you can read it at your leisure, little snippets. Um, this comes out of uh, the dictionary of uh, deities and demons. Uh, but they make a reference here, uh, Psalm 68 and 16, where it is plainly asserted that Bashan is Har Elohim. Now, I, I, I keep trying to tell people, Try to get into more into the Hebrew translations. The word God is not in the scripture. It's the word Elohim or, or, or El. Some people pronounce it Al or Elohim, Elohim, right? So Har Elohim, I'm talking about the mountain of Bashan. And if you go to, I'm not going to go there right now, but if you go to uh, Psalm 68, verse 16, Basically, it's talking about, it's comparing um, essentially Mount Zion with the mountain of Bashan. But he's saying he will take the mountain of Bashan also. I mean, that's how I'm reading it. But if you understand what Bashan represents, he's kind of saying, I'm going to take, he's saying it to the Satans, the Ashatans. I'm taking your realm and I'm going to lead you captive. Okay, so we're, we're, we're starting to dig a little bit more into it. So Bashan has a deeper reference. And of course, we'll, we'll get to the cows later, but, but Bashan, understand, this, is a, this land is special and it's referenced in the Bible a lot. So um, you might want to uh, get a do a little uh, research on what Bashan means. Okay, so the Canaanites who dwelt there of old, they had a certain, uh, they, they looked at Bashan a certain way. Um, it had a special meaning to the Can Canaanites. And uh, it's a spiritual meaning. So let's kind of delve into what was it that the inhabitants of the land thought of Bashan. And why do they think that way? So in uh, uh, Amos uh, chapter 4, verse 1, they mentioned Samaria, but uh, they also mentioned the, the, uh, the, 
the bulls of Bashan in reference to Samaria, right? Well, the key is what what was Samaria famous for? That's the northern king, the capital of the northern kingdom. Remember they split Israel was seceded from Judah and they went apostate and started worshiping idols. Well, what kind of idols were they worshiping? So um, Amos uh, chapter 4, verse 1, Samaria is the point of pushback, but the idea doesn't depend on Amos 4, 1. Jeroboam's golden calves in Dan, in uh, Daniel, uh, 1 Kings chapter 12, and Baal cult, bulls of Bashan, not Samaria, right? It's, it's about these bulls being worshipped, uh, uh, idols. Remember when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, what was the first thing they did when Moses was gone for a while? They fashioned a molten, a golden calf, a cow, right? These cows have symbolic meaning, more than symbolic. Moloch, one of the gods worshipped, was always depicted as a bull, right? And when you understand uh, about, um, and this is not the video for it, I've, I've done it in other videos, um, but understand that Elohim means mighty ones, and there's more than one mighty one. In fact, what did Yah Yahweh say, Yahweh being the creator of all heaven and earth, the, the Elohim of Israel, right? The mighty ones of Israel, right? He said he defeated the Elohim of Egypt, right? So you could say, well, what is that? He threw down a bunch of idols, statues, or are there actually other Elohim? Now, this isn't the video for that, but yes, there are other Elohim. But there's only one Yahweh Elohim. And I say that carefully because there's more to that than meets the eye. But Yahweh, essentially a good English word, for the Hebrew Yahweh would be eternal, the eternal one, you know, he, the self-existing. He, he is, I am. I am that I am, right? Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. So he distinguishes himself as the only one able to say, I am the eternal Elohim. I have no beginning of days nor end of days. I have always been, I always will be. These others are created Elohim, what we colloquially call angels, right? And there's a long story. I'm not going to dig into it here. I got other videos that, that I've done that talk about it, and I will do some more specifically on angels. But understand that these, these idols are being created. Men are being directed in the spirit to create these idols that uh, or symbolize something that actually exists in the spirit realm. And these forces are fallen, if you will, fallen angels. Molech being one. Or Molech is a very uh, high level uh, demonic force. But I just want you to get to the spiritual aspect of it. These bulls are more than, than meets the eye. And the, and the Bible keeps bringing them up. It, when the Bible keeps doing that, you have to pay attention. It means something deeper, right? So these bulls of Bashan, let's think of them as symbolic of demonic forces, right? Just for a minute, let's think of it in those terms. And this will this will all start to make sense. Um, just don't take it at, at face value all the time. I mean, sometimes it's just what it is. But when the Bible keeps going back to it, there's something there. So these bulls of Bashan represent spiritual entities. So in the uh, Ugaritic mythology and in Canaanite iconography, the calf was associated with Baal. So you got Moloch, you got Baal. All these uh, pagan god type deals. But these are actual entities, ultimately. So it's associated with Baal. Later, Jeroboam I constructed golden calves at Bethel and I, which he associated 
with the worship of Yahweh. I hear they spell it Yahweh, but it's Yahweh, not Yahweh. Uh, construction of silver images and the worship of calf images, which is one of the re- all this is the reason that Israel was ushered out of the out of the promised land. They were kicked out of their inheritance for worshiping these other gods, these other deities, and essentially they're essentially fallen angels. I can get more detailed with it, but for now, just think of it in those terms, and these. Fallen angels want to be like the Most High. They want to be worshipped by men. And so they got half the world worshipping them, you know. Even Israel starts bowing down to these things. These entities sought long and hard to destroy Israel because Israel was God's God's, uh, hammer. So they had to chip away at the hammer until there was no hammer left, right? So anyway, we'll, they, they did this uh, despite the warnings in Hosea chapter 13. Now the bulls of Bashan, the context of Bashan, it has connections to the underworld and the Rephaim. Rephaim, if you don't know, and this is the first time you're listening to uh, my channel, the Rephaim are the, essentially descendants of the Nephilim who are the sons of the fallen watchers, angels that procreated with human women and begat giants. Well, the word actually is Nephilim. Um, King James translated it as giants. It doesn't mean a Nephilim has to be a giant. We'll we'll see that towards the end. Remember, it'll be like the days of Noah. That means the world will... If you understand what happened in the days of Noah, we're coming right full circle back to it. Only this time, it won't be a flood of water. It'll be a flood of fire. If you are picking up what I'm putting down. So these Rephaim are essentially um, most notably giants. Doesn't mean that they're all giants, but that is a, uh, you know, one of their, uh, that's an indicator, (laughs) if you will. So, so the Rephaim are giants, also the Anakim are giants, but they all descend back to, back to the Nephilim. And the Nephilim did not survive the flood, so people wonder, well, what happened to them? They apparently did survive the flood. No, these are lesser, if, if you want to call them lesser Nephilim. They're not the powerful super beings, uh, monsters, but their descendant, their DNA, survived the flood. And we should, by now, we should know enough about DNA to know that that's very logical. Because only eight souls survived the flood, Noah and his family. None of the Nephilim survived that flood. So people need to stop saying that. But each of Noah's sons were married, they had wives. Noah was chosen because he was perfect in his genes. It says generations, but root word is genes. His bloodline contained no Nephilim DNA. It was pure, and so he was chosen. But that's not to say that his wife or uh, one of his son's wives didn't have that DNA in her. So it survived. That survived the flood, and every so often it pops out. In fact, it popped out enough to where they bent, they started forming little tribes and we'll get into it but it starts it starts to come back they start making a comeback and one of the things Yahweh told Israel he raised Israel up to do certain things and one of them was to wipe out the remembrance any Nephilim remembrance wipe it out and these Rephaim and Anakim are the descent the genetic descendants still giants just not on the scale of their predecessors. And so, uh, connections to underworld and Rephaim, Baal certainly associated with the underworld. Baal, um, one of the renderings, the definitions, uh, or translations of the word Baal is Lord. So, and again, this is not the video for it, but people keep praying to the Lord. Essentially, they're praying to Baal. 
you know, so read the Bible when it says, Lord, that Hebrew word is Yahweh. That's the name of the creator. And they replaced it with Lord. That's pretty much what the Israelites did. And we look back at the Israelites and see, say how silly they were to do, have done that. Well, we're doing the same thing. You know, so, so there's no new thing under the sun. So we, we should be aware of that and take it seriously. So the geographical indication Bashan functioned as the depiction of the divine abode in Psalm 68 and Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy thirty three twenty two, also without article, related possibly to Canaanite mythology, which places here the heavenly slash infernal dwelling places of its deified dead kings. So this Bashan has a spiritual aspect. In the eyes of the Canaanites, it was like almost like a, a holy land for their gods. You, know, you follow what I'm saying? And, and, and then the Most High says, I'm going to take that mountain. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Essentially, I'm going to lead captivity into captivity. And so continuing, uh, biblical geography, tradition agrees with the mythological and cultic data of the Ugaritic texts. According to uh, blah, blah, the abode of blah, blah, the dead and deified kings and his place of enthronement. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, in amazing correspondence with bi biblical tradition about the seat of King Og of Bashan, one of the survivors of the Rephaim who lived in Ashtaroth and Edri. Okay, this King Og, that's where I wanted to get to. King Og was a Rephaim. He was a giant descendant of the Nephilim that, or, or through, through genetics, his genes. And he was a giant. And he ruled over other giants in the land of Bashan. So Bashan is like a portal. <laughs> that's how the Canaanites view it. A portal to the underworld ruled by the Rephaim, the, the Nephilim. So what we have here is Nephilim worship, sort of. Okay. Um, we'll move on. But there's a connection with these Nephilim. And you got to understand, what is a demon? So you have to go back to my old uh, videos, like my, I think it was the first uh, five or six videos that I did I talked about the def what is a demon where do they come from well, when, when Father Yah flooded the earth his intent was primarily to get rid of these Nephilim who were replacing his creation they were devouring all the food devouring all the resources and when they ran out of resources, they ended up devouring his creation, started devouring men, and men cried unto the Most High, and he heard them. He said, my creation, man, will not survive this. I have to intervene, and he did, and he drowned the Nephilim. He destroyed them because they were too powerful. So that's kind of the plan. If, if you even look at the world today, I just see people, some heartless individuals, and they're generally very rich, doing things that I look at them and go, you do realize this is nuts, what you're proposing. You do realize this is absolute greed. You know, these people, I'm not so sure, are not Nephilim. I, I, I know some of you might uh, roll your eyes on that, but Understand that the gene is still around, and so, and there's other scriptures I can tell you, and I'm not going to go into it in this video, but there's scriptures that insinuate that the one we tend to call Antichrist, you know, the, the one in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ, he rides a white horse, and uh, there's two guys in Revelations that ride, rides a white horse. The first one is the false messiah. But it says something 
and prophecy about this guy. And it says his seed is uh, something, uh, something on the order of a seed. Is, uh, they will mingle themselves with the seed of men. Who's they? And who is this guy riding a white horse? And he's quite powerful. Anyway, going back to the original subject, I'm trying to stay on track here, but understand these entities we call demons are just the disembodied Nephilim. Remember Nephilim, there is no place for them. They can't, Yah, the, the most high in heaven will not claim them. They're not his creation. He didn't create them. It was an abomination. So there's no place for them. And so they wander the earth. Now, even in that disembodied state, they were so powerful, men had to cry out. They were still super dangerous. They were destroying men, even disembodied. And so Noah and his sons cried out and said, hey, we need, we need help. So, yeah, go back and watch my videos. Uh, it's the Jubilees series. Um, I'll put it in the, uh, the description. But it's the Jubilee series. I go all into the book of Jubilees where they tell you, you know, people argue and say, oh, the sons of God didn't mean they were angels. Yeah, well, the book of Jubilees tells you, yeah, they were angels that procreated with human women. It wasn't some other group of men called the sons of God. No, they were actual angelic beings that took on human form to procreate with women and begot Nephilim, giants, monsters, if you will. So, going back to this, uh, Har Elohim, the mountain of the gods, essentially, a mountain of the mighty mighty powers. Um, so, it, the Most High, Yahweh Elohim, the eternal mighty one, is going to claim that mountain. He's going to take He's going to take their kingdom from them, basically. This, this struggle, this war that we are in the middle of. It, we're, you know, we're like, what's the old saying when two elephants fight? It's the grass that suffers. Well, a human beings are the grass as the two elephants are fighting, right? So just be aware. We fight not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. So the bulls of Bashan... Okay, we, we have to focus carefully on, on these. Most people don't even realize it's a prophecy. But yes, it's a prophecy. So we have to think carefully as we go through it um, and tie everything together. Tie Bashan uh, in the Psalms. Tie it to, to uh, Psalm 68 for context, right? Because there's a lot going on. And if you tie it all together... Um, stuff starts to make more sense. So uh, here's uh, James H. Charlesworth. He does a, a theological uh, writing on the symbology of Bashan. And he gets into it. So it's not like I'm making this up. It's other people see it too, right? So the purpose of, present, of the present essay is to publish discoveries that appeared as I was completing a six-year project that seeks to comprehend serpent iconography. Okay, now we're going to start talking about serpents. It, it's all connected. It's all demonic. Okay? Um, so iconography and symbology in antiquity, this search led me to the appearance of Bashan. Okay, we're back to Bashan again, right? So I'm not going to read uh, all of this, uh, but there's a reason now he's starting to go down this path about the term or, or symbolism for serpents. What is the meaning of Bashan? Um, does Bashan not mean simply an area of land that is east of the Sea of Galilee? Hmm. Should Bashan be translated dragon snake? Okay, now it's getting weird. Right, so we went from a simple oh the bulls of Bashan to Molech to Baal uh, to giants and Nephilim uh, 
uh, Rephaim, Anakim, and now does Bashan mean dragon? This is getting strange. Is one word missing? What is the date of Psalm 68? Is Psalm 68 a catalog? Are the words uh, shaped by an echo from earlier uh, in Psalm 68? Should one seek for an understanding? What has been learned? Well, I'll tell you. Let's, let's go for it. Are you ready? Let's get it. So, what is the poet thinking when he links Bashan and the sea? Okay. Bashan and the sea. When we see the word sea, we should automatically kind of, uh, our ears should stick up, right? Because sea is often that place of many nations and tongues and, you know, the Roman Empire came up out of the sea, the beast out of the sea, right? Should the mythology behind the bicolon be enunciated so that Bashan, symbolizing the land, is parallel to Yam, symbolizing the sea? Okay, so in his writings, he's starting to parallel things. Um, so here we have a little Hebrew. Does the noun... Bashan have, that's kind of how you would pronounce it in Hebrew. Um, does it have a meaning in addition to the place? The translator of the Septuagint seems to have been somewhat confused. Okay. So does Bashan have a meaning in addition to the place? Well, does it? Let's see what we can see. The most help in comprehending Bashan as having a second meaning, dragon snake comes from the cognate languages, the, the Ugar. And I'm not an expert on all these foreign languages, but yeah, there's something to uh, think about here. In the Akkadian Basmu are cognate to the Hebrew Bashan and the Aramaic Patan. Right, I'm trying to get this right. These terms are equal to the Arab Bathan. All these nouns denote some type of dragon or snake. Okay, so there's some connection with Bashan and a dragon. Hmm. Then the dragon is adjacent to the yam, which is the sea. Hmm, more prophecies that we missed, that we didn't quite see coming. So, just understand that Bashan has a, a spiritual connotation. Psalms 22, verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. And my tongue cleaveth to my jaws, and thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked having closed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. And it's King David prophesying again. He's going through the crucifixion in the spirit. He sees it. He knows what's coming. Land of the Rephaim, serpent seed. So, again, we talked about these Nephilim and their descendants through their DNA, which survived the flood, became known as Anakim or Rephaim, or just simply giants. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that part so that you, you take, you're not just taking my word for it. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 28 Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart, saying the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. So this is when they were entering, the, or they sent out spies to spy the land. Um, and they, an evil report came back. Uh, we, can't, we can't take this land. The, the, the Rephaim are there. The Anakim are there. The, the offshoots of the Nephilim are there. Then Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10. 
The Emims dwelt there in times pa past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims, which also were counted giants. So there we go again, giants in the land. So what is it at the crucifixion that the Messiah is seeing? Remember, his predecessor, his forefather David, said they were bulls. As he's talking about a crucifixion scene, he sees bulls around about Deuteronomy chapter 3. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbath of the children of Ammon? Nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth thereof, after the cubit of a man. And a cubit was basically around 18 inches, um, just from the tip of your fingers to your elbow. Some king, they said, this is the standard, you know, which was a good thought at the time. You know, it wasn't out of the ordinary. But understand, this whole thing King David seeing in a vision, he's talking about a crucifixion scene. My my bones are all out of joint. Um and he's suffering. Um his tongue is cleaving to the roof of his mouth, he thirsts. Um he's suffering, right? But he also mentions being surrounded by bulls of Bashan, right? So what well, was Jesus surrounded, or Yahusha? Was he surrounded by bulls of Bashan? Hmm. Let's think this through. Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 12. It's either that, or maybe King David was just tripping. He didn't see the actual. He Maybe he saw some of the crucifixion scene, and then he had another dream or something. No. The, he saw bulls of Bashan, which tells me that when the Messiah was on the cross looking down, he also saw bulls of Bashan. But what are these bulls? Remember, they're spiritual. These bulls are actually Nephilim. And what are Nephilim today? They were destroyed. Their bodies were destroyed, but their spirits endured. And what do we call those spirits? We call them demons. So, if you were there, you were looking at this crucifixion and you saw a bunch of people walking by deriding the Messiah as he's dying on the cross. But that's not what he's seeing. He's seeing bulls of Bashan, of Bashan, right? He's seeing bulls of Bashan. He's seeing demons and fallen angels celebrating what they believe is his demise. See, there's certain things the Most High keeps secret. Because if you think about it, would the would Ashatan, would the would the Satan's have crucified Christ if they realized his crucifixion was going to free human beings from the bonds of death? Uh, no, they thought they just had him. And they were probably thinking, man, this was easier than we thought. Man, we took we took this dude out. It was a piece of cake. So Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 12. And this land which we possessed at that time, from Aroer, which is by the river Arnon, and half Mount, Mount Gilead, and the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites and to the Gadites, and the rest of Gilead, and all Bashan, being the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half-tribe of Manasseh. All the region of Argob, with all Bashan, which was called the land of the giants, the Rephaim, the Anakim, the Nephilim, the children of the fallen ones. That's what Bashan is. It's a portal. It's a gateway to the world of the dead, is what the Canaanites believed it to be, apparently. And here's Messiah seeing strong bulls of Bashan. And they're like railing on them. And in the physical world, what you could kind of see it as the Pharisees and, you know, all his enemies are, are, are 
just hurling insults at him and deriding him. He, the man is dying and they can't even, can't even leave him alone. That's how evil these people were. But what was in these people that they could do this? Oh, he called himself the son of God. What, what is in these wicked people? They're possessed. They are possessed by demonic forces. And the Messiah could see them. And he called them bulls of Bashan. Now that's deep. You'll never read that the same again. So the Messiah is seeing demonic forces that look like bulls. Psalms 22, I will declare thy name unto my brethren in the midst of the congregation. Will I praise thee, ye that fear the Lord. Praise him, all ye the seed of Jacob. Glorify him and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. But when he cried unto him, he heard. Well, that'll do it for today. I hope it, it made some sense. Um, I know there's a lot going on there. But just know this. I love you all so much. Thank you so much for continually supporting my content. If you did enjoy this video, please hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they'd find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. And thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. I very much appreciate you all. And shout out to the channel members. And may everybody have a beautiful and blessed day who's in the body of Messiah, Yahusha, Hamashiach, and I'll see you on the next video. Shalom, my brothers and sisters. Shalom.